So let's welcome him down. Give a round of applause for Tom Abbott. Hello. Yeah, not bad, right? I ordered it a long time ago. I didn't make it, unfortunately. There you go, sir. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, so I have one question to kick it off before I turn over to the audience, uh, as a Jason geek myself. Whose decision was it to bring Jason back? Because as most of us know in part five, there was no Jason, there was Roy. But uh, there was a copycat killer in that one. So whose decision was it, the, the studio or you? Because you wrote the film as well. Um, was it your decision or their decision to actually bring him back from the dead? Yeah, I mean, they seriously wanted to finish it at four. And <laughs> personally, I thought that that was the best of all the Jason movies, but um, the fourth one, yeah. final chapter, you know, kind of told the best story, I thought, in terms of, you know, what the genre was. And then they decided, you know, there was so much juice in this lemon, and <laughs> we got to keep going. So a new beginning happened, and they decided, no, they were going to make Jason an ambulance driver, and the fans hated it. So... You know, and quick, I guess, you know, we got to, like, make it up to the fans. Let's bring him back. So uh, they saw a film that I had done, my first film, One Dark Night. And, thank you. Wow, thumbs up. Uh, and I'm trying to remake that. And if you do that, <laughs> believe it or not, or re-envision it, I should say, because I want to show the beginning of what I wasn't able to shoot for $800,000. And, um, you know, try to bring it up to speed a little bit, but not lose the gothic and claustrophobic thing. Anyway, I digressed. Um, the marching orders from Frank Mancuso Jr., who had the franchise, is bring back Jason. I don't care how you got to do it, just bring him back from the dead. So being a fan of the Universal Horror movies, I chose the old lightning bolt you know, technique that worked for Frankenstein. And I figured that if I was going to do one of these, part six, I couldn't take it seriously. But I also wanted to make it scary, but I was really looking to make a comedy at that point in my life. So I said to him, you mind if I put humor in it and make the characters likable and clever? He said, just don't make fun of Jason. I said, nope, we'll keep him the unstoppable monster. And kind of what happened is it, it sort of evolved. Um, if you guys go online and look up um, Legends, what is it called? Uh, Legends Never Die. Um, Hollywood Forever, Legends Never Die, Hollywood Forever. There's like a six minute black and white documentary that they did of how I wrote this movie, which was at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, literally right next door to uh, Paramount Studios. And you also see what I'm planning to do in my afterlife when they meet back in some other way other than the lightning bolt. But um, yeah, check it out, you'll see how twisted I am. And um, you know, how my third act is gonna be once I'm in the coffin. I was, I have Jason's coffin and that tombstone, you know, which I'm still holding on to, hoping somebody either gives me a lot of money or I give it to the Motion Picture Academy, uh, which I'm leaning more towards doing. But yeah, that was it. That was the only marching orders was bring him back. And so I, he gave me pretty much, you know, free reign to do whatever I wanted. We lost Dan Bradley played Jason in all the daytime stuff. We shot for like, I guess, five days in the daylight. And he was our stunt coordinator, and to put it in Paramount's uh, language, he spent too much time around the craft service table, and the clothes were getting you know, more and more stretched, and they said, I'm sorry, this is just not Jason. So they made this decision to grab this, you know, basically he was, a, I guess, a bodyguard or a, a bouncer at a, at a club in, in Hollywood, and they thought he looked cool, C.J. Graham and brought him out, and he had done nothing before. He just got out of Marines. So every direction was like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he moved, if you've noticed, like a machine. And at first I thought, mm, well, you know, I like the ter Terminator aspect to him. I mean, how the hell do you know how somebody moves if they get rocked back with a lightning bolt? And I tried to set the whole tone of the movie with the James Bond thing in the beginning, going, okay, here's the most successful franchise. We're going to do it again. We're going to have fun with it, and hopefully at the same time, you know, keep it, you know, entertaining. I thought the fans were going to kill me. You know, there's no sex. You know, there's a lot of the rules. I kind of twisted and changed a little bit. But I just, you know, it's just my comedy background. I just wanted to make it fun and entertaining and, uh, you know, see what happens. But much to my shock, it's been sort of the fan favorite after, I mean, 30 years next year this thing was made. So it's... 
you know, every generation seems to find it, and I think, I could be wrong, the comedy sort of takes some of the curse off of it a little bit. You know, some of the jokes, the no exit joke, some of these things still work. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful to that. But yeah, it was pretty much here, you know, go make your movie, which was great in those days to have that much creative freedom. No, that's awesome. I love the, the fact that Jason is a supernatural being after this movie and then onward is awesome. Like, it brings a totally new, you know, thing to the character. And then he gets to fight, you know, more supernatural characters along the way. That yeah. opened a lot of doors, I think. Yeah, character. none of us expected that. Oh, it's, yeah. it's going into what, part 13, I think? Yeah. 12 or 13. <laughs> I thought it was over, you know. <laughs> Keep them coming. I'm Keeps cool on coming. Yeah, yeah, we're good with it. Uh, all right, let's open the questions up to the audience. Raise your hands, guys. Any questions? This is right here. The uh, little girl named Nancy, is that intentionally a uh, reference? Um, that's a good question. Uh, actually, it's not. It's to, to Nancy McLaughlin, who played Lisbeth in the film, who I was married to. And, and, and uh, so, it, yeah, it was more for her, all the praying and stuff. She's very very fundamentalist Christian, so I kind of put that into the, you know, into the movie. Still killed her, but, you know. <laughs> Actually, there's one great story I, I'll try to share really quick. Uh, since CJ was a Marine and basically followed orders, the one scene there at the, at the Volkswagen, you know, he, we had one window, that was it. You know, we could all afford, only afford the one breakaway window. And basically, you know, CJ, she's sitting in the driver's seat, just take that spear and go right towards her, and she's going to get out of your way. I'm like, yes, sir. So, you know, action, you know, she moves out of the way, and the Marine in him just went right with the target and went bang. And I mean, it went doom, like that close. And of course, my first question was, are you all right, honey? Yeah. Great. What a great shot. Thank you. You know, I mean, that, it's like, it really adds a dimension to it. And of course, he was so apologetic. He says, I I'm sorry, I just saw her, and I... <laughs> you are a true filmmaker. Yeah, but, you know, Did you get killed? No. No. All right. Of course cool. not. Okay. We got the shot. Well, I got cold. It was cold. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Right up there. Uh, you, you had asked him uh, originally if it was the studio's choice to bring Jason back. Uh, my question is, was it the studio's choice to have it kind of open ended at the end, or was that more you? At the very end? Yeah. Yeah, this thing had about three different endings. Um, one of them was um, the uh, deputy. Um, you know, gets locked in the sh cell. We actually shot a moment where he's screaming and he's trying to grab the keys and stuff, and then he hears the door open and he's like, you know, oh great, and then his face changes and the camera comes in on him. And we went, okay, that works, but mm, it's not great. Then I actually wrote a scene where um, you see the caretaker, who wasn't killed in the original version, we added that later. Um, and he's back at the cemetery, and this guy steps up, and he's like, oh, hi, Mr. Voorhees, yes, uh, I've been keeping care of the grave for you as, as, as you wanted, and then you actually meet Jason's father, you know, and the, basically the studio said, yeah, great idea, but after the last part five, when people thought, oh, shit, Jason, you know, it isn't going to come back, now we got to tell him for sure, we're not going to introduce some other guy and going to be now about Jason's father, keep it Jason, so that never got shot. Um, and then I can't think we did some other thing with the ending and ultimately kind of came up with that one moment with his eye and if you look, his, his hand does this so you get the sense, okay, he's, he's down where he should be, ending basically the legend, but he's still alive. And then I figured it was next, up to the next guy to figure out how to bring him out of the water and keep him going if they chose to. It's their problem now. Yeah. <laughs> Right here, sir. So, um, when the studio had you make a movie, did it give you any specific like, censorship almost? Because I know that later on, Jason like, had tested tons like, of censorship. Like, yeah, we. Some, you had some off screen shows, but you also have like a net fully breaking. So, I was wondering. Like, yeah, we. Um the movie, the one Danny Steinman did before me, Danny came out of porno. And so, <laughs> a lot of sex. And he really had a thing about enjoying the kills with the women and so they were really brutal and the motion picture you know uh whatever they call it, motion picture committee ratings board just was like they were gunned to get mine and i purposely wanted to go in and make the kills first supernatural something that you know a human couldn't imitate and try to do them as tasteful as you can but still you know give the gore thing so there was like when the 
officer gets his head crunched, you know, you see a skull come up and the part of the brain come up, they cut that out. You saw the triple decapitation, all the heads coming off and hitting the ground, they cut that out. Um, Sissy, when she gets her head twisted, you know, literally see her neck stretch and, you know, everything goes up, you know, and snaps, you know, they cut that out. So it's, it's all like bits and trims. But the thing they targeted, the thing that bothered them the most and got the most trims was the sheriff being bent backwards, you know, and hearing the snap of his, you know, spine and bang. They kept coming after that. And it's like, there's no blood. He goes, well, it's cumulative. You know, it's like, after all this, that's horrible. And it's funny, because, I mean, it's an old, you know, bending somebody back, you know, like that. It's, you know, it's the old thing I actually borrowed from a routine I did with Dick Van Dyke in the chiropractor where we did this same kind of thing. But, you know, put in a horror context, you know, for them it was a bit too much. So, yeah, there was, there was, nothing was really cut in terms of actual kills, but they were trimmed down considerably. And there is a lot of, uh, I don't, I didn't remember how much gore there wasn't in the movie. Like, it, it's all, it's all like, I don't know, it's all, it all happens off screen, but it still works. Like, the sound effects and stuff, you yeah. know, still give a lot of, like, you know, make the cringe. And I find that most of the time in, you know, horror movies when people are getting killed, the sound gets me more than the visuals do. But, of course, we want to see blood, so. <laughs> of course. So it's unfortunate. It must be blood. But, yeah. Any other questions? Right up there. Yeah, uh, speaking of sound effects, I have a question about Sissy's kill. Mm -hmm. um, when Jason twists her head off and pulls it off and stands there looking at it, we cut back into the cabin and there's a sound effect that sounds like he punts her head. <laughs> there's a thumping sound effect. Yeah, it was. I, well, I think it was the thump of the head dropping. Oh, it always sounds like he's just gonna punt it. Oh. <laughs> it sounds like he punts the head. You have to blame. I think it was Dane Davis did our sound effects on this thing, but you know. I can't put him down. He went on to win Oscars for the for Matrix and a lot of other sound design stuff. So, you know, he came up with some pretty gnarly stuff. But I think that if I believe, he pulled it off and dropped it. Just like, oh, there was another thing when Jason punches out Horshack's heart. You know, they actually saw it hit the ground and saw Jason step on it and twist it. And you know, you you hear the you know sound, but you you know that was another thing that you know was cut. We want to see that cut. Awesome. I mean, this cut was great too. <laughs> you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a nine screenings, you know. Yeah. X, 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 X. Okay, finally, you know. Or that many screenings? Yeah. Nine of them wow. went through. Yeah. Oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, guys? Hey, Tom, can you tell the story about the RV flip and the air conditioning unit? <laughs> um, yeah, that's on. The, I, what was that on the Camp Crystal Lake memories? DVD, I think. Um, and I didn't know this. Uh, the RV scene was literally the last thing we shot. Uh, if you ever go back and look at the movie again, where he's standing up on the RV, you can see daylight just starting to come up in the background. You know, we were killing ourselves to do this stunt and, and to make it safe. And of course, the guy that we hired, we, we couldn't bring in a Hollywood stunt man. We got a local guy from Covington, Georgia who came, I swear to God, in like an evil Knievel jumpsuit. I'm ready to do it, let's go! You know, and we were like, okay. Um, and we reinforced it the best we could, because we, you know, we had to do this to this motorhome. And we kind of kept everything on, including the, um, you know, the air conditioning unit. And for some reason, Don Behrens, who was our production manager, and was cutting me right and left through the whole process of the, you know, the, the things I wanted to do, like, you know, supposed to have a crane shot and it's like where's the crane oh darn that didn't show up oh I'm so sorry well he ended up saving them I don't know twenty thousand dollars or something which allowed us to shoot some additional stuff at the end which I had no idea I thought we were like over budget the way he played it but he had this dream because he had some RV of his own and he wanted you know that thing and he hoped that they would do they would tie it down in such a way that it wouldn't get destroyed but since nobody liked this guy, they loosened it up and they literally, you know, when that thing went, their first person to look at was him as that, you know, unit came off and went crashing, banging and watched him just go, there goes, you know, his whole little bonus right there. The, the only thing he wanted. But yeah, the, it's funny with the crew. We all got along incredibly, but whoever's holding the purse strings becomes the villain. And, you know, this was, I guess, one of the ways, and I didn't know this, this is how the crew got back at him. Yeah, I'm sure you're already nervous, you know, when a stunt like that is... is oh, yeah, you know, you're, yeah. yeah, especially not knowing, you know, how this, if this guy was going to 
walk out of that alive. But, you know, he did, you know, he kind of stumbled out and, you know, did the, all right, you know. But his head must have been ringing for days, because, I mean, that's a lot of, like, you know, pressure, you know, that thing hitting like that. It's a great stunt, it looks awesome. Questions, one or two more, that waving person up there. So talking about all the cuts that you had to make, is there any possibility for a re-release of all of the kills back in there? You know, we've really tried to, re you know, do that. Um, we went back in and looked for all the trims. We talked to Paramount, you know, is there boxes of those things any place? And so far, no one's been able to find them. I had a really old, I think it was actually a beta copy of the movie that we made kind of early on that had some of those things still intact. And they pulled some of that out that's on one of the Friday the 13th special edition things where you saw some of that stuff. But yeah, I, it, you know, it's, it's like the, you know, the negative One Dark Night. We believe it was just thrown out because we made the movie, it was made as a tax shelter for a, a Mormon investment group. And once we showed it in the Bahamas three days after we shot it, they went bankrupt and said, okay, we did it. We got our tax deduction thing. And, and so when they came around to getting a negative for Movie Lab, it's like the company shut down and we believed they just tossed the thing, figuring it wasn't worth anything. So now it's like hunting out, hunting down, you know, decent prints of One Dark Night, you know, that are, hopefully there's a few out there still. So one day we're hoping to do a Blu-ray, you know, on the thing. But yeah, in terms of uh, Friday, yeah, that's, you know, that's it in the moment, unless somebody uncovers something someplace. And Paramount was kind of notorious for not, like, they liked the money that Friday made, but they didn't, they didn't really like it in terms yeah. of for their production. Yeah, we were constantly, every one of them, you're hiding from the unions. You know, we shot this in Georgia under the title, A Lad Insane, you know, the David Bowie thing, because uh, that's what Frank Mancuso loved was Bowie things. And, um, but still people found out, you know, all the masks, the actual masks were all, you know, ripped off at some point or the other through the process oh, of shooting. No. Yeah, I mean, you know, the people find out, yeah. you know, Jason was pretty popular, but certainly not as popular as he's become. We had no idea that this was going to be, you know, the sort of endearing monster with Michael Myers and uh, Freddy and uh, Pinhead and, you know, all, and Chucky and all the 80s. We just thought we were like bums, you know, <laughs> we we're never going to make good movies like the guys made in the 70s. I mean, those guys, you know, Godfather and Star Wars and shit. We just thought we were like, all right, we're making a living, you know. And, um, but you know, as the years go by, it's, it's amazing because, you know, every generation discovers it on TV or, you know, DVD or whatever. And I probably get more fan mail now than ever from people worldwide that, you know, and you go, really, that's amazing to me still. I, I'm, I'm shocked, but I'm happy that it still entertains after this many years. Really does. And those, all the monsters from the 80s, because like a, a lot of effects artists or artists in general, you know, who, been doing it for so long they say like the original universal monsters are what got them into you know those were the monsters that gave them nightmares as kids and this and that but my generation the generations before these are our universal monsters you know like that that's dracula that's the mummy that's wolfman to us so it's 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 really special to be you know sitting here with you you know one of the guys who got to tell the monster what to do <laughs> literally yeah. writing with the monster yeah, yeah it's, it's fun thank you yeah all right, guys, we have time for one more question. Yes, sir, right over here. Okay. Did the critical reception ever bother you guys with people like Cecil and Ebert calling you basically criminals for making these movies? Well, if you remember that review from Cisco and Ebert, it's like they, tra they showed some clips, they trashed the movie for about five minutes, and then they said, and we didn't even watch it because we're not even going to waste our time with this thing. We know what it is. That being said, much to all of our shock, we actually got, and I've, I've got the reviews, like Hollywood Reporter, Variety, the LA Times, New York Times, Joe Bob Briggs, you know, all these reporters loved it. And, you know, it was like shocking, but part of it was because, you know, I broke the fourth wall and had somebody go, you know, some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. So you're <laughs> making fun of the thing that you're, you know, you're doing. And for the critics, it's somehow took the curse off it a bit because you go, well, you can't hate a movie that's having fun with it, you know, with the genre. And then years later, I was given this script called Scary Movie and by Kevin Williamson. And I read it and I went, you know, I kind of made this movie already. I, 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 you know, 
know, so I passed on it, and then about six months went by, and all the other scripts were shitty, and I went back to my agent, and I said, what happened to that, that scary movie one? I, I think maybe I should do that. He goes, eh, too late, Wes Craven got it. And I went, oh, all right. And of course, that's the one that took off. But years later, I, I met with Kevin Williamson on some project, and he says, you know, I gotta admit something to you. You know, your Friday the 13th was the one that inspired me to do the thing. And I went, son of a bitch. I knew I, you know, I knew I felt like I'd seen this before. But, you know, which was a huge compliment to me, because I thought he did a great job with, with uh, Scream, you know, which, which is what it became with Scream. Um, and, you know, an incredible series that, that, that in that franchise, but that was, you know, obviously even more humor than mine was. Yeah. Scream is pretty awesome. I forget how good it is. It is very fantastic. Yeah. All right, guys, I think that does it for our Q&A session. Give a round of applause to Tom again. Thank you guys so much. I love you. And hopefully I'll be back this next March. We were at the, our band, The Sloss. Um, we're at the last uh, South by Southwest, and I think we're coming back again this upcoming one. So if you can check us out, you know, to see a bunch of guys in their 60s still hitting it as hard as we can hit it and doing as hard a rock and roll as, as we, you know, you can possibly believe, please come and check us out. Oh, yeah. So it's a new life for me, which I'm digging quite a bit. Thank you so much.